Kingdom greetings, peace be unto you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. This is David Jones, more excellent ministry, your Bible study student today and also teacher expositor of the Word of God. I pray that this week for you has been a blessed week and that you are still maintaining in this 2020 year in which our Lord Jesus Christ is soon to return and we are delighted today to know uh, that we are coming to the final close on this very hour uh, as we approach the next year of 2021. Uh, we've already won in 2021. It's a blessing, amen, to come to this point in time in history. Uh, this year has been a severely uh, impacted many, many people uh, who have suffered a lot of losses. Um, but through it all, uh, God has allowed us and sustained us uh, to continue to persevere through everything that we've experienced uh, this past uh, current year. It took us by surprise. Uh, we were shocked, but we were not shaken. Um, we were let down, but we were not defeated. Uh, but through it all, God will bring us through another glorious year. Now, uh, previously, the past couple of weeks, um, I've been speaking directly to a group of people, uh, namely the brokenhearted uh, people, according to the scripture where Christ was sent to. Uh, he was sent to a group of people uh, called the brokenhearted, uh, an audience of people who have experienced uh, many sufferings, many heartaches, uh, many pains. And he said, I've came to heal uh, the brokenhearted people. Now, I want to continue uh, that lesson that I started a couple of weeks ago. So this is going to be a part two, so to speak, or a prayer to, I would say, uh, to continue uh, what I've been speaking on concerning the brokenhearted. So this title is for there is there is hope for the wounded. And many people today who are in the body of Christ um, have suffered uh, wounds, many wounds. Uh, some are still carrying uh, wounds after a significant amount of time even years for that matter, um, and it's very hard for them uh, to disconnect or to uh, lay aside this particular wound that they have. Uh, for some reason, they, they just uh, are not really to let go. Others um, don't know how to let go. Uh, so I want to bring this, uh, this teaching uh, to those of you who are experiencing uh, pain, uh, who have experienced brokenheartedness, who are in a suffering time, uh, and you'd be surprised how many people are attending church services today uh, with a bleeding heart. Uh, saints come in the church heartbroken, they leave the church heartbroken, and they quite just don't know what to do. Um, they've tried many remedies and done many things, but still the pain uh, does not go away. So I want to address uh, these issues because I feel as though that Christ simply said, I came to heal the brokenhearted. So we know uh, that Christ wants to heal those who are brokenhearted and he does want to take away the pain. It is important for us before we enter into the year of 2021 um, that we release this, these pains or the release uh, some of these hurts that we've been carrying around, uh, especially uh, during this time of pandemic. We've lost loved ones. Uh, some of us have lost places of employment. Uh, all of us have lost careers. Um, the people have uh, filed for bankruptcy, businesses, uh, divorces have taken place. So there's a lot of healing that needs to take place amongst God's people uh, in order for us to continue uh, this course that has been set before. So I'm healing the brokenhearted in 2021. Now, the scripture text uh, that I uh, choose to, to come from tonight is going to be in the book of Hebrews. That's the book of Hebrews chapter 12. And you may have heard this text before because it is a common text uh, that is read in the church today. Um, and it reads as follows. That's chapter 12, verse number one in the book of Hebrews. So he says, therefore, we also, the writer says, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, it says, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily besets us or so easily ensnares us. 
and let us with endurance uh, run the race that is set before us. He says, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. So, very common text. We've heard it before, but I want to do my best tonight uh, to break this text down and to explain to you uh, what the writer is trying to convey to an audience. Now, in order for us to get a real good understanding of this message, we have to understand who the writer is and who he's talking to. Now, as I said earlier, the Bible is a book written by Jews, for Jews, to Jews. Now, it's obvious he's talking to a Jewish group of people called the Hebrews. Okay, these were not Gentiles. Uh, they were, these were actually Jewish converts who had just recently come to Christianity. And Paul, most theologians and scholars believe that this is actually Paul writing uh, to this particular group of audience, uh, addressing some particular issues that these Jews were having. Now, uh, having said that, um, we must understand that the Bible is written for us. It wasn't written to us. If you consider yourself a Gentile, who is a Gentile? A Gentile is simply a person who is non-Jewish, by specifically by blood. However, if you consider yourself a Jew, as Paul says, he was a Jew, not only born of, of the stock of Israel, but he was a Jew inwardly, which was, was the circumcision of the spirit. So whether or not you choose to take whichever nationality or whichever um, part you choose, and that's totally up to you. Um, but he is addressing a Jewish audience, a Hebrew uh, group of people who have just recently come to come to Christ. Now, the oldest actual manuscripts of this text is in the Greek language. It is not in the English language. The English language is a translation of the Greek and the Hebrew language. So the original language of this particular text or this book is actually in the Greek, and it is called pros Ebreos, okay, pros Ebreos. Now, over hundreds and even thousands of years, uh, languages change. Uh, some more, some less drastically. Uh, but if you can see here, the pros, Ebros, was actually a derivative of Ebrew. Okay, so the, the H was added later uh, as time went on. Uh, but prior to that, it was Ebres, or where we get the word Eber, who was uh, the son of Shef, or the grandson of, of Shem. Okay, so Eber, Hebrew, um, Eber Knights or Eber Knights. So over time, uh, these languages began to change. So we're speaking to an Hebrew or an Eber group of people and to translate the pros Ebros, which means two Hebrews. So we're speaking to Hebrews. He's not speaking to Gentiles. Again, if you consider yourself a Gentile, he's not writing this to you. You just have an opportunity to read what Paul was writing to another group of people. And that's where the Gentiles come in, because salvation was never uh, created or designed by God for the Gentiles. But because the Jews rejected their Messiah when he came. Paul took the gospel to the Gentiles, and therefore the Gentiles have an opportunity to get on in the salvation plan that God created. Had not the Jews rejected their Messiah, there would be no hope for the Gentiles. All Gentiles would be eternally condemned and burned in an everlasting fire. But because the Jews rejected their Messiah and they crucified the Son of God, Paul says, okay, God sent Paul, raised up Paul, called him, anointed him, and said, now go to the Gentiles that my house may be full. So this exhortation and warnings of the Hebrews indicate that the recipients of the early Jewish Christians were in danger of returning to Judaism. Now, prior to Christianity, the Jews kept the law of Moses. That was called Judaism. They had the, the scripts or the, the commandments that Moses had, uh, gave to the people, uh, the, namely the children of Israel. So that's all they had was Judaism. So when Christ came, Christ came to fulfill that law. Um, he came in such a way that they did not even recognize that he was their Messiah. So these particular new Jewish converts were under such scrutiny and persecution at this particular time 
um, that they didn't want to forfeit their salvation. They wanted to return back to Judaism to avoid uh, the particular persecution that was taking place. Now, Judaism at this time was sanctioned by and protected by the Roman government. Now, understand that at this time there was a government like it is today, and this particular government was called the Roman Empire, and they were governing the Jews at this particular time. So the government at that time, which were the Romans, prohibited, they allowed, or they, they, they consented with Judaism, but when Christianity began to enter in it, they did not want that to take place. They did not uh, consent to Christianity, though therefore persecution arose. So these Jews began to be, uh, they felt threatened. Uh, their lives were uh, impending change wherever they want, went to. So they wanted to return to Judaism, so Paul had to correct uh, this particular Jewish audience. Many Jewish believers, having stepped out of Judaism into Christianity, wanted to reverse or return their course in order to escape persecution from their own countrymen. So Paul begins to say, at this verse, chapter 12, verse 1, he says, Therefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, Okay, so the witness here, the writer is referring to the martyrs that took place in chapter 11. So when you're reading the book of Hebrews and you come to chapter 12, well, if you read verse, well, you read the chapter 11, it's going to explain to you what Paul is referring to. So the martyrs he's talking about are simply the martyrs that took place in chapter 11. It is the word, the Greek word, periekomi. Okay, perioko me. Okay, in the Greek language, it means to lie about or to be encompassed about, surrounded, clothed with, to be in submission to, or actually in circle, and in, in some instances, is actually being hung. So, what is Paul saying here? Paul is actually saying that these particular people who he's speaking about. In chapter 11, the faithful martyrs from Adam all the way up until the, the prophets have already ceased to live. They've already deceased, but they are now encompassing. They are now surrounding. They are encircling those who are in the same course or the same life that they were once in. So this is the cloud of witnesses that Paul is speaking about now. If you read in the Gospels, you will see that there was one time Christ, uh, Moses, and Elijah appeared to Christ, and the Scripture says, in a cloud. Okay, on the Mount of Transfiguration, the Scripture says Jesus' face became altered, and his clothes became white and glistening as the sun. And Peter and James and John were with Christ at that time, and they happened to see Moses and Elijah talking to Jesus in a cloud. They were in another realm, that realm of glory. Well, this is the same cloud that he is speaking about uh, to the Jewish converts, namely the Hebrews at this time, indicating that you are not alone. There is a cloud. There is a witnessing. There is a encompassing around every believer, almost in a spectator or theater type of form of those who have gone on, those who have passed on, who are watching, who are guiding, who are instructing, who are cheering, who are rooting us on in this race of faith. Now, I need you to hear me on this. Okay, these martyrs, okay, namely the, the particular martyrs described in chapter 11. So who are these particular martyrs as he's describing? Well, in chapter 11, he says Abel, he says Enoch, he says Noah, he says Abraham, he says Sarah. He speaks of Isaac, Jacob, and Joseph, Moses and his parents, Joshua, even Rahab the harlot who God saved uh, because when she hid the spies, when Joshua became and Caleb began to enter into the city to destroy the city, uh, God, uh, Elijah, excuse me, Moses uh, spoke to Joshua and Caleb to go into the city and to take the city. However, there was a woman who hid the spies at that particular time. And it was a sign that when you do come into the city, she would actually hang 
a red scarlet cord out her window signifying that that house, don't go in that house, don't kill anybody in that house because she had made an agreement with Joshua and Caleb. Now this is also called uh, the scarlet thread of redemption. It is a type of Christ's uh, blood uh, being, being shed or, or covering us so that when the angel of death were to come through, they won't be harmed. So this was actually the scar of redemption. It was actually a cord uh, that this lady Rahab hung from a window. She's also a woman of faith and God saved her. So he speaks also of uh, the scarlet thread of redemption. He speaks of Barak. He speaks of Samson. He speaks of Gideon. He speaks of David. He speaks of Samuel and the prophets. And these are like, these are all heroes of faith who are in this cloud. Now, during the Roman times, they had what they called theaters. It is the Greek word theatria, which means there was a coliseum like stadium. Uh, built, if you've seen the ancient pictures of Romans empires, uh, they almost had these stair steps that were kind of inclining or descending up in a circular type of form, similar to the stadiums that we have today. And at the center of the stadium, they would have the games. They would have the athletes playing and you can watch. Well, this is the analogy that Paul is trying to portray to these new Jewish converts at this particular time. We are actually being witnessed, being witnessed or being observed by this cloud of witnesses who are in this uh, structure-like stadium surrounding us, watching us, cheering for us, rooting us on to finish the race that is set before us. These are the witnesses the Bible says. Okay. So as a witness, they are sometimes regarded as spectators. Okay. And the Greek word is, again, it is the actual theatre or the martyrs. Yet this Greek word should not be understood as referring simply to those who testify or witness, but those who are watching. Okay, they're observing us. They are, they are seeing us, our progress of faith. They are seeing uh, where we are in the race or in the course. All right, so their faithful witness should also be a constant reminder to encouraging us. So those who have walked this race or this course that we are living in, the Christian walk of faith or the race of faith, are actually rooting and cheering for us to finish and to enter into heaven and receive the prize. So we do not struggle alone because the same struggles that we are experiencing, our brothers and our sisters are experiencing that same struggle in, in the earth today. So we are not the first to struggle with the problems that we faced. Others have won and the race will have won before them and the witness stirs us up to hassle to also have to run with them too. So we're not in this alone. So Paul begins to say, lay us a lay aside. He begins to say, lay aside every weight and the sin which does so easily beset us. And this is the text that I want to focus on because this is the first step for healing. This is the first uh, prerequisite that we must do in order to obtain, in order to receive the healing power of Christ. He says, let us lay aside every weight, meaning that there's more than one. And he also says, and the sin which so easily ensnares us, easily besets us. It slows us down. OK, he says, lay it aside. He didn't say throw it away. It's a difference there because there have been some teachings that says that. Um, we ought to throw these things away. Well, everyone um, is not ready to throw it away, but it's more easier, watch this, to lay it aside. I'm going to show you that in a few minutes. I've heard other messages about that it's trash. Well, God never mentions trash in the Bible. It's not a single word in the Bible that God speaks about when it comes to trash because God does not consider these issues, these, uh, these wounds, um, that have inflicted and injured, injured us in our life as trash. Okay, they're very sensitive issues. 
Um, there are issues that that go back for 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 sometimes even years for some of us. So God doesn't look at it as, as trash. It's nothing to be thrown it away. He simply says the first prerequisite in order to obtain healing, inner healing, emotional healing is to lay it aside. Don't throw it away. Just simply lay it aside because when you lay it aside, you're actually taking it off of you. Okay, you're laying it aside. You're removing the weight that you have been carrying for months, for years, and you're laying it aside. Now, it has a very uh, a powerful effect, uh, that word laying aside, because that laying aside, this weight uh, has a connotation that is still, is still near me. I, I'm not ready to, to, to throw it because throwing requires more faith uh, throwing requires it to go a distance where I, I can't see it. I, I, I can't touch it. I can't feel it. I, I need to just lay it aside. And God understands. God understands the pain. God understands the suffering. He understands the wound. So he, t he tells us to take almost like a baby step, so to speak, not to offend you, but a, a simple, small step of in order to, to, to take this course to find Divine healing in your emotion, in your mind, in your spirit is just put it aside. Put it somewhere where you can still see it. That's going to still give you comfort. You, you put it somewhere where you can still touch it every now and then. That's still going to give you comfort. You, you put it somewhere that you may even have to, to go back to it. It's still going to give you comfort. So this is the first uh, baby step that those who have been wounded need to take. Just lay it aside. When something is laid aside, it's still in your presence. When something is, is laid aside, it is still reachable. When something is laid aside, it is still there. You can still uh, have it uh, as almost to, to, to bring you some type of comfort. And God is, is saying that there are people who have these wounds and these pains that never seem to go away, uh, no matter what they do, because they haven't taken the first step in laying it aside. See, see what happens is people uh, have been taught almost wrong uh, by saying throw it away. Well, God doesn't want you to throw it away. And it's wrong to, for some preacher or pastor to tell you, you need to get rid of it. You, you, you need to, to put it away. You, you need, no, you need to lay it aside. That's what the Bible says to do. You lay it aside. That way you still have it close to you. It's still near to you. He didn't say throw it away because that requires more. He didn't say throw it away because throw it away means it's out of your distance. And a lot of times people throw things away and then they go look for it again. And then they bring it back to them again. See, that, that's the wrong way of approaching this, this issue, this, this healing that needs to place plate, this weight. Because once you lay it aside, it's all for you. And now you have more freedom. You have more uh, liberty to run the race. Because it's, it's weighing you down. It's slowing down your, your progress. Um, it's, it's slowing down um, you, from you reaching your, your divine uh, inheritance that you have in God. Because it's a weightiness that is upon your shoulder. Now watch this. He says he, says, he, says, he, says he wanted to lay aside. Uh, requ requires some gentleness. You see, he didn't say throw it. That doesn't require gentleness because some of these issues are so sensitive, they must be taken with gentleness. Losing a loved one is a very sensitive issue. Losing a parent is a very sensitive issue. Losing a sibling is a very sensitive issue. Losing a child is a very sensitive issue. It requires gentleness. And gentleness is simply laying it aside. It's still near me. I can still pick it up when I want to. I'm not ready to, 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 to remove it totally out of my life. And God understands. But he says, take the first step in laying it aside. All right. So for now, just to lay it aside is so that you can still have the comforting knowing that it is still near me. As long as I lay it aside, it's off of me and I don't have to carry its weight. Every weight entails that there may be more than one. The weight here is called the alkonos, which is bulk or mass. 
okay, in the Greek. A burden, a hindrance, um, as in bending or watch this, bulging by its low. See, this was why it's important to understand how the Bible was written in the Greek and Hebrew language because you're not going to get these definitions from an English vocabulary. You have to understand that this Bible is a Greek and Hebrew Bible, and in order to understand it correctly, we need a Greek and Hebrew definitions. So he says here, this word, what I just mentioned to you, has a meaning of bulk, a meaning of mass, which can cause bending or bulging. It's not just a bending that takes place when this weight is, uh, is upon a person, but it can also have a bulging effect. Let me show you why. Because when a weight is on your shoulders for an extensive period of time, you begin to walk funny. When, when, when weight is placed upon your life, you begin to bend. Your, your, your spinal column begins to bend towards downward because the weight is so heavy. And now it distorts, watch this, your vision. You're not able to see correctly because your 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 everything is bending in a downward position, amen. And 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 now the vision that you that once you had is hard to to see. And this is how the enemy uh, trips up many Christians by allowing these weights that to carry on their shoulders for long extensions of time. And if they don't learn how, and if we don't learn how to lay aside these weights, there's going to be some negative consequences that come after that. Not only is this weight a bending, but it also carries a bulging effect. What do you mean? Well, a bulging means something that is placed upon you for so long, you begin to expand, watch this, in a vertical position. This weight has a twofold aspect to it. One, it causes bending or stooping over, and two, bulging by its load, which means after a while, the bulging part of this weight causes, watch this, inflammation. And doctors and scientists and medical uh, physicians understand that the root of all illness and sickness and disease is because the inflammatory system has been compromised. That's right. The inflammatory, the system is now inflamed because now it is expanding. It is bulging because of the excessive weight, because of the burden or because of the, 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 the pain that has been inflicted upon this individual's life. Now sickness, disease, and even possibly premature death comes in because they have not learned how to lay it aside. It says, in the sin which so easily ensnares us. Now watch this. He says, ensnares us. This sin has a serpentine uh, snake-like effect. Okay, this is sin. Sin has a serpentine snake-like effect. Sin has a serpentine snake-like effect. If you remember in the Garden of Eden, the, the Bible mentions how the serpent was more cunning than all the animals. OK, it has an effect that it can easily surround him, encircle him or entangle him or her, causing the believer to become easily distracted from looking unto Jesus. So with the sin done, just like sin, just like the the crowd of witnesses that are encircling us, who are surrounding us, sin mimics that same atmosphere. All right. He, Satan is a mimicker of God. He has no uh, creative power within himself. So what sin does, sin watches and observes what the creator does and then copycats it. That's what he does. That's what he's been doing for millions of years. So the serpentine uh, snake-like effect, what is that? What are you talking about, the serpentine? Well, if you understand, if you've ever seen a snake, okay, specifically a boa constrictor. A boa constrictor doesn't have fangs. A boa constrictor doesn't have uh, poison to use its, to kill its prey. It circles around its prey and then locks its muscles around the prey and squeezes the life out of its victim until the victim can no longer breathe. And this is what sin does. It entangles 
it encircles. It has a serpentine-like a goal to accomplish in the believer's life until it circles the believer to the point that that causes uh, 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 suffocation, cannot breathe. You, you, and I'm not talking about physical. I'm talking about spiritual life. Sin has a way of, of, of sucking or draining the life of the believer out because of its serpentine-like effect. All right, so you have this, this serpentine-like effect that sin causes, and it's an entangling, it's an encircling, uh, as if the crowd of witnesses are doing the exact same thing. All right? Now, the serpentine or sin has no creative power, as I just told you before. However, it watches the creator and then begins to mimic it. The serpent sin thwarts, watch this, or prevents the believer from accomplishing something. Now, this is not the weight. This is actually the sin that ensnares, the sin that besets. OK, now watch this. He said the serpent sin doesn't stop the believer, but changes the believer's direction. And this is how cunning sin is. This is this he's, sin is very uh, deceptive in its way because he knows that um, for most part, excuse me, he cannot stop the believer. Because a believer gets to a place in its Christian walk of faith that uh, it's he's not or she's not going to stop. You, they, they've reached a level of faith where they are going to press into the kingdom. And the enemy knows that. Well, once he understands that, uh, he begins to, to plan or to devise a new scheme for that individual. See, the sin is very cunning because after a while, if Satan were to stop you, um, sooner or later you would catch on that you're stopped. And immediately you would jump back in the race and continue going on. But for those who are running this race, who are unstoppable, so to speak, he knows he's not going to stop you. But if he can get you to go another direction. If he can get you off course, if he can get you to be distracted and take that same energy, same diligence, same zealfulness and go another path, he's got you. Okay, he's got you. He's thwarted the vision. He, he, he not only uh, thwarts the vision, but he, he's pointing you into a, another direction, still off course. Still moving, still making progress, but going to a different direction and another finish line because at the end of that course, there's something else waiting for you too. So this is the, 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 the serpent sin. It's not designed to stop. It, it, it's designed to slow, to thwart, and to move the Christian believer into another change of direction. How does this sin besets us? It thwarts the racer from finishing the race, slowing down, uh, 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 thwarting the vision. The vision becomes unclear. Uh, hopelessness sets in. Uh, um, uh, unbelief begins to set in. And now the believer is, is slowly moving in another direction because of the thwarting vision or the serpentine-like sin. Okay, sin besets us. It troubles or threatens us persistently. It attacks on all sides. It hems in as in a dense forest. And a lot of times, uh, sometimes when we're, we're, if you've ever been in a forest, you've ever been in the woods, um, you don't immediately uh, uh, come into a dense woods or a dense forest. It's, it doesn't start out that way. You can start out walking in a woods and, and everything, you know where you're at and you know where you're going, but somehow or another you look around and everything just looks dense and everything the same. Well, this is what sin does. It, it's, it's a progressive, slowly uh, a, a movement into another direction where now you've reached a place where you don't know where you're at and you're lost. All right, so it attacks on all sides. It hems in with this dense like forest type of gold. Okay, we can be beset by, watch this, difficulties. We can be beset by enemies. We can be beset by illnesses. And we can be beset by spiritual blindness. 
The sin that the writer here is talking about is in the Greek word is the hamatia or the hamatia, which is interpreted missing the mark. Missing the mark. This is the hamatia sin or missing the mark. Okay, or to err, which means to err. All right, so what is missing the mark and what is the mark? Well, so let's get a clear biblical definition. Not what you heard, not what someone's told you, not what you think missing the mark is. Let's go into the Bible and see what the Bible says about missing the mark. First John 3 and 4. We're going to get a clear definition of what sin is. Because I see that in our community, in the black community, um, and especially in the black church, we don't really have a clear understanding of what sin is. Because it's not talked about. Um, it's not it's not explained. It's not taught in the pulpit. Uh, so 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 we go through our, uh, our existence here on earth uh, calling this sin and calling this sin um, and, and, and saying you, you can't do this and you, you don't do that because that is sin. Well, I've come to the conclusion that a lot of things that we're calling sin are not. OK. And I'm getting ready to show you this. 1 John 3 and 4. This is what the Bible says what sin is. So the Bible, in my, in my belief, the Bible is the ultimate authority. It is he, God has the last say-so on whatever topic or whatever issue that happens and pertains to all of our lives. He has the final say-so of what sin is. So 1 John 3 and 4 says this. Whoever commits sin transgresses also the law. Okay? Whoever commits sin also transgresses the law. Here's what sin is. For sin is transgression of the law. Period. That's it. Sin is transgression of the law. Now, you can see how many things we just eliminated of what sin is. We've eliminated a whole lot. So what about those other things? I'll show you that and I'll tell you that later. But the Bible says that sin is simply transgression of the law. All right. Another version says, I believe it's the KJV says, whoever commits sin also commits lawlessness. And sin is lawlessness. So sin is lawlessness. Not having any law. It is utter lawlessness. It is do anything you want. It is, it is, it is not having any type of restraint. Or, or any type of uh, 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 compulsion to not do wrong. So that's basically, according to the scriptures, what sin is. So sin from God's perspective is lawlessness. Okay? So the question is, so why are, are black churches are saying that we're not under law or we're, not, we're, not, we're, we're under grace when the scripture clearly doesn't say that at all? Okay, because Paul mentions a lot of things that pertain to the law. What does he say? Well, he says that there's the law of grace. He says that there's the law of life. He says the law of the spirit, the law of faith, the law of Christ. So what does he refer, what does he refer to if we're not under law? Because if we're not under the law and we're, we're in lawlessness, there's a whole lot of people still in sin. I've got the answer to that. You don't have to tell me the answer is. I know what Paul is talking about. But under grace, there's the law of grace. Explain that. Well, we need to understand what the law of grace is. Because if we don't, we're in lawlessness and we are still in sin. Here it says, Apostle Paul mentions these numerous words and times like this. The law of grace, the law of the spirit, the law of faith. So because there are certain aspects of the law that we are still to and still held accountable for. There are certain aspects of the law that we are still held to and accountable for. You tell me, why. well, there's a courtroom in heaven and there's a judge that's going to sit in that courtroom after you expire from this life. And in that courtroom, there's going to be witnesses. And in that courtroom, there's going to be a judge the Bible says God in the Elohim simply means judge, okay? And we're going to have Christ there as our advocate, and there may be an adversary or the prosecutor, which would be the Satan himself. 
Therefore, there's going to be, the Bible says, there's books going to be opened at that particular time and we are going to be judged. We shall all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. Law still exists, ladies and gentlemen. There's laws we still got to abide by. Just imagine if this country didn't have laws. Can you imagine the, the chaos and the confusion and, and, and everything that would exist if there was no laws? Well, it's the same thing in the body of Christ. There are laws that we are still held for and accountable to. Sin is transgression of the law. Sin is sheer, utter lawlessness. All right, so, all right, so we go here. So there's a courtroom in heaven. God will be the judge in that courtroom. So the mark is the law. That's missing the mark. There's a laws, there's standards that God has set forth in his word that every believer, every Christian, born again Christian, must live by. And when you miss that mark, you commit sin. It's very simple. The law is the mark. We miss the mark, we commit sin. All right. Missing the mark is breaking the laws. Missing the mark is breaking the laws or the commandments of God. The law of God is God's standard of living. Missing the mark was a Jewish terminology during Paul's time, referring to an archer with a bow and arrow, aiming a target trying to hit the center bull's eye. When the archer missed the mark, he became disqualified and did not share in the winning prize. So understand that the context that the Bible is written in and the culture of that time in order for us to get a clear understanding of what God is saying. So, so Paul is using an analogy So, and these words or missing the mark was quite familiar in the Jewish culture and in their, in their lifestyle. For us, it is foreign. We don't know what missing the mark is because it's, it is not a cultural term. So missing the mark, they knew what missing the mark is because they understand that there were people who would play games and they would have a bow and arrow and they would shoot that bow and arrow to try to hit the bullseye. Today, we can relate that to probably a dart game if you've ever played darts. Well, if, if you didn't hit the bullseye, you missed the mark. Okay? They became disqualified and did not share in the winning prize. That would be missing the mark or, or not upholding to the mark that Christ or God has for us. So a clear def definition of sin is simply missing the mark. Okay? All of the rest of the things we can put in different categories. Let me give you some, let me give you, let me give you some ideas. Okay. So a lot of the things that our black communities, and I'm not going to get too deep in talking about this, uh, because it's, it's, I'm not, I want, I want to stay with the subject. A lot of the, the, the problems that we are facing as, as black people is not just the, the systemic racism or what it's happening. That's one, that's one big problem. But there's more problems in, in the black race than just racism. Many more problems. Many more issues that we got to deal with and many more issues that we have got to change and many more issues that we have got to get delivered from. Number one is a lot of social ills in the black community. Social ills. What do you mean? Well, we've been preconditioned. We've been preconditioned as people from childhood up until adulthood that Certain things are just okay. Certain things are just acceptable because it is cultural. It is the, the way of life. It is the, the lifestyle. These are social ills. They're not sin in the sense of missing the mark. They're just social ills. What is a social ill? Smoking is a social ill. The Bible never says nothing about smoking cigarettes. It never mentions anything about nicotine. It's a social ill that's accepted in the community that is uh, 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 given to us, which we adapt, and everything's okay. 
It's not a sin other than it destroys the body, but your body is a temple. But it's a social ill that has been preconditioned on our minds and in our culture that is acceptable. Drinking is not a sin. It's a social ill. It's a social ill that is accepted. It's a social ill that it is okay. It's a social ill because our mind tells us it's not illegal. It's accepted. We can purchase it anytime we want to. We can consume it anytime we want to. These are social ills. Gambling is a social ill. It is not a sin that God is going to send you to hell over, but it's a social problem. It's a social ill that black people in the black communities have been doing for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years. And now we tolerate it. We accept it. It's the norm. Dysfunctionalism is rampant through the black, black community. And I'm not just talking about unsaved. I'm talking about dysfunctionalism goes into Christian lives too. That is the hauntingness, the, the most... A haunting thing that we black people have experienced is dysfunctionalism. Dysfunctional. Dysfunctional is, 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 it can affect a child on many different ways. And, and, and they know that. And here's, here's the ignorance that comes in when it comes to us black, because that's another curse that we have. Just playing out flat out ignorance. And they know that dysfunctionalism, watch this, can do more damage to a child than anything else because they've got the statistics. They've got the, they've got the writings that they say that if a child, watch this, if a son is born into a single parent home when there is no father, that child is already preconditioned, predisposed to become a drug dealer, a drug addict. Or criminal activity. They know that. They know that because they've got it in black and white and they got the statistics and the statistics don't lie. Therefore, you have a dysfunctional family. You have dysfunctional uh, generations after generation after generation of children, both boys and girls, who have fatherless. No fatherly parental supervision. And they know, watch this, the outcome of these particular individuals. Now, of course, I'm generally speaking because there are some families who have maintained a minimized a dysfunctional. But all you have to do is look around in your family and you can spot and see the dysfunctionalism that's going on. It's a way of thinking that has damaged the black people. It's the thinking process. It's the decision making. It's, it's, it's not understanding or knowing what is truly right and what is truly wrong. Because there's a lack of morality because of the social ills. So the problems that we're dealing today are not necessarily sin. It's morals. There's no morality. Drinking, smoking, premarital sex. Killing, fornicate, all of this is, or is lack of morality. Divorce, lack of morality. Because if you were to go to other countries, they don't do this stuff. They, they, don't, they don't participate in it because they have a conscience or they have a moral standard in which they're going to keep and they're not budging from it. But it's only America you see these things. It's only America you see a lack of morality. It's only America that is accepted in in other countries, divorce is not accepted. It's against the law. In other countries, abortion is against the law. In other countries, having premarital sex before you're married is forbidden. In other marriages, it's a sh in other countries, it's shameful for women to drink and smoke. They have morality, but the United States of the snakes of America, we don't. Lack of morals, lack of social ills, dysfunctionalism coupled along with racism. So now they got us preoccupied fighting against racism, but yet the black people in the black church and the black communities are still dysfunctional. Can't discern what is right or wrong because it's not being taught in the house of God.
You have a lot of inspiration in preaching. You have us preaching over these things, not preaching against sin, it's preaching over sin, and therefore you have a whole generation that doesn't know what to do. Only the only thing they have now is that they think what is right is wrong. But that's not going to cut it. Because you have men out there, young men who are on the street who don't know what's right or wrong. Because they haven't been taught. And they could care less because their conscience is already seared. So therefore, they'll kill a man for just looking at him wrong. And they say, that's okay. That's accepted. This is how we live. They, they will commit these heinous crimes and have no remorse, no conscience whatsoever, because the conscience has not been conditioned. The conscience has lost law because there is no law. There is no right from wrong. So now you have a group of people, a generation growing up thinking right is wrong and wrong is right. And that's what's happening today. You have a group, a generation of, of people from 20 years to 30 years, even 40 years old, can't discern right from wrong because they're already preconditioned to these social ills and this immorality and it's accepted and that's what they want you to continue doing. You can fight racism all you want. If you don't deal with some of these problems, we ain't going nowhere. We'll never get to that promised land. And therefore, because it's not being taught in the house of God and pastors or preachers are not standing up for this, God says, I will judge my church I will judge my church and I will continue to judge my church until somebody stands up against the priest of truth. But, of course, nobody wants to get offended because offended doesn't bring in the offering and offended allows people to just walk away. And, of course, pastors and preachers don't want to do that. It says, lay aside every weight in the sin that so easily besets us and let us continue to run. So we have a clear definition of what sin is. This is not a sprint this is a marathon that we are running. It is not a sprint course that we are engaged in, but it is a marathon, which takes stamina, it takes determination, it takes perseverance, it takes diligence. And if you understand the two races, uh, if you've ever seen a sprint last no more than 10 seconds, there's some form of of, of accountability that you must have when it comes to training and physically exercising your body in order to last that 10 seconds. But a marathon takes a little bit more energy. It takes a little bit more patience. It takes a little bit more endurance because you are, if you've ever seen marathon runners, they run huge laps over and over and over and over again. So this is not a sprint that the walk or the race of faith that we are in. And some people think it's a sprint. And what happens is they burn out. They, they, they put all their energy into something uh, and not pace themselves in order to make it until the end. Christ said, he who endures to the end shall be saved. And they burn themselves out. So this is a marathon race that requires endurance. For he that endures to the end shall be saved. He who endures until the end of this race will be saved. The race of faith is described by having three components. First, it is to be run by laying aside every weight because the weight is going to hold you down. The weight is going to hinder you. The weight is going to slow you down and it's not going to allow you to make that progress that God desires for you to progress to. This refers to impediments that weigh us down, whether clothing or excess body weight. Now, you have to be physically conditioned to run this race. Physically. Ministry is physical work. And you have to be physically prepared, physically nurtured, uh, physically healthy in order to run this race of faith. Now, this diligent runner must be... Uh, in a place where they understand that there is a prize or a finisher. He's the, the Bible says Jesus is the author and finisher of our faith. He is at the end of this race looking towards us, cheering us or helping us all, along the way. Okay. Now the Holy Ghost is there also. So, so we have a, we have, we cannot be uh, easily distracted or easily taken our minds off of Christ who is at the end of this race. 
We also have the surrounded cloud of witnesses who are around us. And then we have the sin and then we have the weights that we must lay aside. So when you see in the Bible says, let us, that's something that we got to do. Anytime you see let, that's something that you got to do. God's not going to do it for you. Let means implies something that you have to do in yourself. Second, it must be run by putting off or entangling sin. Now, it's more, Paul is speaking more about one sin than many sins. Let me show you something. He's not talking about sins. Because there comes a time in the believer life where he begins to strip or he begins to remove the sins from his or her life. Uh, because the work of the Holy Spirit is taking place in the heart. But there's one particular sin that everybody struggles with. There's one individual sin that's designed to keep you, to hold you, to ensnare you, to hinder you from finishing the race. Yours is not mine's. Mine's is not yours. Yours is not the next person. But there's one sin. That if you don't uh, uh, get right, and if you don't conquer, and if you don't defeat it, it's going to slow you down, it's going to hinder you, it's going to encircle you, and eventually it's going to suck all the life out of you so that you won't make it to the race, make it to the finish line, or it's going to deter you into another direction. He's talking about this one sin above all others that has the possibility to defeat the believer. The sin may be different from all other individuals. It is the one sin that you will struggle with, with sometimes, for sometimes, for the rest of your life. And that's actually not true, but some will. They don't have to. But some will struggle with this sin for the rest of their life. Because see, what happens is, sin will begin to speak to this individual and say, you're going to be like this for the rest of your life. There's no way you are going to ever change or get rid of this. And you might as well go ahead and just accept this. This is the lie. And just carry this for the rest of your life. Because there's no way God's going to set you free. No way you're going to be delivered. So you might as well just go ahead and just receive it. That's a lie. And some believers will believe that lie. And they'll struggle with this one sin. Not two. Not three. Not five. It's that one sin that will keep flaring up. That one sin that will almost like the thorn in the flesh will just keep buffing, buffing, buffing and nagging and encircling and trying to force his way back into your life. That's what Paul is talking about, the sin that so easily ensnares us. He's not talking about many. He's talking about one. Third, it is to be wrong with patience or this word patience is actually the hoopane and I'm getting ready to go into detail about that one. This word, it is patience or the endurance. This is not the patience of waiting. See, the Greek has a very peculiar vocabulary when it comes to words. And God is marvelous in choosing the Greek language to write his, his, his word through because patience, us, means patience. But patience in the Greek can mean five definitions. So this is not the waiting patience. This is the enduring or the persevering patience he's talking about here. So it is the, the hoop. The scripture calls it, or the, the Greek calls it the hoop honey, the hoop honey, meaning steadfastness, perseverance, continuance, uh, constancy, uh, enduring. This is the hoop or the hoop honey. It is patience, uh, continuance, and doing good, hopefulness. And cheerfulness looking unto Jesus. The hoofene patience. Now, hoofene is in the feminine noun part, parts of speech. And that's very important to understand this. Patience is often described in the Bible as a she. Because it is always in the feminine gender. Patience. You may have known someone or have known someone. Who, and her name is patience. It's a feminine word. It is connected to the Holy Spirit, watch this, who in the Bible is referred to a neuter now. So when you read the word spirit, which is pneuma, it's neither male nor female. It is genderless. 
Watch this. Because the Spirit, Holy Spirit, is likened unto the angels, which are neither male nor female. I'm not going to go into detail about that tonight. I'll save that for later. So patience is the hoopphane. The hoopphane. Now notice here that Greek word hoop. H O O P O N O N O M O N A. Hoopphane. Again, the, the, the Bible is such a fascinating book. God doesn't use a lot of words when, you, when you're reading it in the Greek and Hebrew text. You'll see the same word 1,500 times all through the scriptures. But you won't see that in English because it's not written in English. It's a translation. So when I'm reading the Bible in the Greek, I see the same word pop up again and again and again and again. And it, it, it's, it's right there. It's hoopane. Another Watch this. Circle. Now, a hoop is a circle. Very circle. And I just mentioned to you three circles. I mentioned one, the circle of the cloud of witnesses. I mentioned two, the circle of the serpentine sin, which encircles you and, and, and sucks your life out. And now, patience, again, is a circle, which is a hoop. Or a circular hoopfane. Now, watch this. There was a time, and some of you older generation can understand what I'm talking about, where the little girls would play a certain game. And, and, and this game was called hula hoop. It was a circle, plastic type of ring that the girls would place on them and they would spin and keep the hoop going around them. Watch this. Now, if they didn't perfect it, the hoop would fall to the ground. And they would pick up the hoop again and keep practicing. And once, and once they perfected it, they would be able to spin that hoop for hours effortlessly. No no thought had to be done with it. It was a very simple, simple game that required no little to have none effort. You were doing the same thing over and over and over again. And that hoop would just stay to the ground. You wouldn't drop it. Watch this. Because you practiced or you perfected the, 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 the talent. All right. Now. Because it's a circle, all you had to do, watch this, was to just continue doing the same thing over and over and over and over again. <laughs> and this is where this is where Christians miss it. Because see what happens, a lot of times Christians come to the faith and they, they get bombarded with, with, with things in the church and they try to juggle all of these things at one time and end up falling all of them begin to fall apart they, they gotta pray two or three times a week then they gotta read the bible three times a week then they gotta go to the christian edu and they get all these things and they get discouraged that that's not the christian walk of faith the, the Christian race of faith or the walk of faith, there's two different ones. There's a walk of faith and there's a race of faith. There's two different ones. See, the walk of faith is a daily walk. The race of faith, watch this, is when you're redeeming lost time. That's when it's time to run because you got to make up for the time that you lost by being distracted, by being led astray, by being preoccupied with other things. So when you, when you come to the realization that you are now uh, back in the race, you got to start running. So watch this. So so the Christian walk or the Christian life is a, it can be a very simplistic life. It's just doing the same thing over and over again. It is spinning that hoop and practicing and spinning that hoop. Now watch this. There were some girls who practice um, the, the hoop so much and they practice it, they could do more than one or two hoops. They would have uh, three hoops around their waist, another hoop around their shoulder, one around their neck, and all they were doing was the same thing over and over. 
not moving, the same type of movement, and more hoops were added. Watch this. See, when, when we learn how to perfect or to master the one thing, God will begin to increase and elevate and add more, watch this, effortlessly. See, it is not trying to do many things. Just practice the one thing. Just stay faithful to the one thing. Just learn how to just hoopinate. Just hoopinate and hoopinate. Continuance, perseverance, uh, uh, steadfastness, and then God will see that and then add it, more will come. Now, 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 that's the hoopane. That's the circle that we're talking about here. The perseverance. And that's how you attain. That's how you, you, you get to the finish line by simply doing one thing. Don't be distracted. Don't try to pick up everything and, and carry all this just perfect one thing and watch God do the increase and watch God do the work. I hope you got that right there. All right. So the actual geek says with hindrance, oh, excuse me, with endurance should run the race that is lying before us. It doesn't say set. They added set. They translated the word set because, you know, that's what they do. But the actual word doesn't say set. It says it's lying before you, which means it's already in place. The course that God has designed for you and the course that God has laid for you is already there. It's, it's waiting for you. It's, it, it wants you to enter into it and start walking and start running in the race or the course that is set before you. Okay? We should run, which means we should exercise ourselves and make progress. It is to run or to walk hastily, referring to the diligent runner. Having a course set before you or lying before you, running quickly. It's a lying before you, it's a set before you because it's already there. This course is to be run, it is present. It is a present course given to the life of the Christian. Present, pre-sent. Pre meaning it's already there, sent. From God, present right there the course that is set before you. Apostle Paul encourages young Timothy in the book of Timothy says, do the work of the evangelist and announces to him that his departure is at hand. And this is what Paul says to young Timothy. He says, I've fought the good fight of faith. Fight. He says, I've, I've fought it. It wasn't physical fighting. It was spiritual. It was learning how to take the weights and lay them aside and run the race with progress. Now, the, the weights that God allows, I, I want to say he places, some weights he allows, because if you, any bodybuilder knows that when they add weight, they get stronger. So there may be times when God begins to add weight, and this is the, the, the peculiar ways of God. He, he will add weight on you only to, uh, to remove them from you. See, he adds the weight on you only to remove them from you. He'll add the weight or the responsibility on you because he knows that you are physically and spiritually and capable to handle the weight. But then he'll also say, I'll help you carry them. This is the ways of God. I'll put the weight on you, but I'll, I want you to lay it aside. I'll, I'll, I'll allow the weight to come, but I want to share with you and carry that weight with you. In other words, you don't have to carry it alone. Christ is there to help you carry the weight, the, the burden, the responsibility. He's not putting it on you and then sit back and watch you struggle. If you struggle, it's because you have not reached a place where you learn how to lay it aside and to allow him to carry it or share it with you. 
So he tells young Timothy, he says, do the work of an evangelist. He says, endure afflictions. And then he says, my departure is at hand. He says, I've fought the good fight of faith. This is the race of faith he's talking about. He says, I finished my course. Notice how Paul doesn't say the course. He says, this is my course. He takes this course personally because everyone has their own personal, individual course from God in this life. No two courses are the same. They may have similarities, but no two. My course is not your course. Your course is not somebody else's course. There's a course that Paul understood that this is my specific course. My course. My calling, my my direction, my way to get into heaven, my way to see Christ. He says it's my course because he knows that every course is different. He says I kept the faith. Now I want to I want I'm going to break this down to you. I'm going to explain this to you because a lot of people think he's talking about faith, meaning his trust or his reliance upon God or his confidence. No, it's much more to this. It's much more to this verse than, than what, you're, what we've been seeing or what you saw. Watch this. He says, I've kept the faith. We, we have a tendency to believe that when the, we see the word faith, it's talking about belief. Again, the, the, the Greek word faith is pistos, which has many, many definitions. And it's not just talking about my belief in God. Yes, it has, it, it has something to do with it, but watch this. He's showing you something different. Okay? He says, I've kept the faith. He didn't say, I kept my faith. You see that? The faith. Paul was very uh, knowing. He took things personal. He understood that there were some things that were given to him directly from God. But right here, he doesn't say, I've kept my faith. He says, I kept the faith, which means it's, it's, this must be a faith that must be common amongst other believers. This is not personal. He's talking here. This faith Paul is talking about is not limited here to his confidence. His, it's not talking about his confidence or his trust or his total dependence upon Christ. But the faith or the truth, it's the truth of the gospel. It is the, the, the truthfulness of God. He's talking here. He says, I've kept the truthfulness of God. I've kept the gospel of God. I didn't preach or teach another gospel. I, I didn't fall away from sound doctrine I, I, I was able to, to, to declare to the people of God the whole counsel of God. He said, I didn't shun. I didn't shun away from it. I kept the whole counsel of God. He taught Genesis. Well, excuse me. He taught the whole scriptures from what he known. And this is what's happening in the black Christian churches today. Preachers are not teaching the whole counsel of God. They're taking bits and pieces of scripture to make people feel happy. They don't talk about the scriptures that's going to hit home or, or possibly cause people to repent and come to Christ and come to a saving knowledge or even hit the broken hearted people who are suffering today and have bleeding hearts. He says, I've kept the whole counsel. I did not shun to declare to the people the whole counsel of God. Listen, it is the Greek word pistos or pistos, meaning the assurance, the moral conviction, moral conviction. Let me say this. He kept the moral conviction. That's what he kept. He kept his moral convictions. He didn't steal, lie, cheat, swear, gamble. All right. He kept his moral convictions. And this is what's gone wrong in the black Christian church today. They're not keeping moral convictions. Morality is out the window. Just give me the word. Just make me feel good. Just make preach me happy. But no one's keeping the moral convictions. There's no moral integrity in the world and in the church. There's a loss of morality everywhere. Everywhere you see, it's immorality. 
it's right there. There's lies. There's confusion. There's talk. There's gossip. There's backbiting. There's manipulation. There's stealing. Morals are out of touch now. Where are the morals at? He said, I kept my moral conviction. I kept my fidelity. His persuasion, his precedence, his credence, his belief in or acceptance of something as in truth. He kept his fidelity, the faithfulness to a person, cause or belief demonstrated by continuing loyalty and support. These words, fidelity, moral conviction, integrity, as Paul neared the end of his life, Paul could confidently say he had been faithful to his call. Thus he faced death calmly knowing that he would be rewarded. What was the prize? Henceforth, he says, there is later for me, here it is, a crown of righteousness, a robe of glory, gold and slippers, whatever. That's the prize. He says, this is my prize, which the Lord, the righteous judge, it says it right here, Elohim, God means judge, who shall give me at that day. There's a courtroom in heaven. There's a courtroom in heaven where we are going to meet him as judge. He says, I press toward, watch this, the mark of the prize. Now, wait a minute. I just mentioned mark a few, few minutes ago. Here it, is, here it is again. Paul is talking about a mark. So what mark is this? He says, I press toward the mark. He says, for the prize. So here he is. He's talking about a mark again, which I just explained to you earlier. The mark was the law, and missing the mark was breaking the law. Now Paul comes and says, I press toward a mark. He's pressing to what? What is this mark? Okay. Let me read you something. Romans chapter 7 and 12. He says, therefore the law is holy and the commandment holy and just and good Romans chapter 7 verse 12 so the law reveals the nature of God or Christ right now where there is no law there is lawlessness and then there is no sin that be, can be accounted for so if we don't know the law, watch this, we are free from sin. So when the law came, watch this, Paul said, when the law came, it brought knowledge of sin, and through the law, sin deceived me. Because he says, I would not knew it was a sin to murder anybody unless the law said, thou shalt not kill. I would not knew that it was a sin to steal unless the law said, thou shalt not steal. So the law, watch this, is good, it's holy, it's just, it reveals the character of God or Christ. Now watch this, Christ fulfills the law. He is the law in embodiment form. So when Paul is talking about he missed the mark, what was he saying? He missed Christ. He, he missed attaining or the character of Christ. Missing the mark or pressing towards the mark. He was pressing towards a person. He was striving to be like a person and to receive the same prize of that particular person. Watch this. He says the law is holy, the commandment holy, just and good. So the law reveals the nature of God. So when Paul says he is pressing to the mark, he is pressing to the knowledge of Christ. Christ fulfilled the law in all aspects. All 637 of them. Christ fulfilled. He said that I may know him. There it is. The knowledge and the power of his resurrection. He wanted to know Christ in such an intimate and close way that he would experience the same resurrection power that Christ received. That's how intimate Paul was trying to get with Christ. I want to experience what it feels like. Watch this. Paul was actually saying, I want to feel like what experience likes to die and then come back to life. That's what he was saying. That's called resurrection. 
He wants to experience the glory of having experienced death, then rising back again in that power, having defeated death. He says the resurrection, and then he also says, watch this, the fellowship of his sufferings. And now this is what Christians don't want to do. They don't want to fellowship with his sufferings. We want the blessing. We want the breakthrough. We want the healing. We want the miracle. But we don't want to fellowship with his suffering. Because soon as suffering is placed in our life, we hit the floor and cry out, Lord, deliver. Lord, bring me out. Lord, get me out of this. Lord, I'm in trouble. This is the suffering that has been appointed to each and every one of us because it's in the course. Do you hear me? It's already set. You are appointed to partake and to fellowship of his suffering. Whatever suffering it can be. Physical suffering. Mental suffering. Emotional suffering. Financial suffering. Any suffering. You're partaking and sharing of Christ's sufferings because there is glory that wants to be revealed, that wants to be manifested in you, but it cannot be revealed or show up or manifest until you share with the suffering. So why do we look at suffering as a bad thing? <laughs> why? Why is the church don't want to suffer, don't want to be persecuted, don't want to suffer for his name's sake, don't want to go through, but we want to inherit the blessing or the promise. It don't work that way. There's got to be some partaking and some sharing of his sufferings. He says what? Being made conformable to his death. In other words, he wanted to experience the same death, but he knew he wasn't worthy. He knew he wasn't worthy to hang on a cross. He knew he wasn't worthy. He had the understanding that, yes, I want to die, but I don't want to die like he died. I'm not worthy to die like Christ, but I want to be conformed to that power, to that resurrection, to, 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 to share in that same glory that Christ had. This knowledge is obtained by experience in daily problems. This is where the knowledge comes from. It is ex obtained by experience in daily problems. Here's the problems. Needs. Sufferings. Persecutions. Rejections. Trials. And adversities. Knowing Christ also entails participating in his sufferings. Watch this. They are his sufferings, not yours. And this is what needs to be taught. This is what needs to be shared in the body of Christ because people think that these sufferings are them and that God don't love them and God is paying them back for what they did wrong and God is, is, is angry at them. No, Paul understood that these sufferings are not my sufferings. They're his sufferings. He's, he's trying to share his sufferings with me so that I can partake and share with the glory of him. His sufferings, not your sufferings. Watch this. He placed them on you to, for, for him to bear. He placed them on you for him to bear. Don't take the sufferings personally. Don't take the, the sufferings personally. It's not a personal attack. That Christ is trying to inflict on you because he's angry at you. No, God took all his anger on Christ. He ain't angry with nobody except sinners. The sufferings that we experience are his sufferings and we are not to take them personally. Paul's desire to share the Lord's sufferings because they bring him into a deeper and more meaningful relationship with Christ. Companionship in sorrow establishes the most intimate and lasting of ties, watch this, as afflicted hearts cling to each other. Let me say that one more time. Companionship in sorrow establishes the most intimate and lasting of ties as afflicted hearts cling to each other. What are you saying? Watch this. Every time we are suffering, 
Every time we are partaking of his suffering, Christ says, I already understand. I've already shared with the suffering. I know what it feels like. So he's already finished the course or the race that is set before us. So he is ahead of us looking, looking in the future back to us saying, I understand. I know what it feels like. He can sympathize, watch this, as a high priest with our weaknesses. He has borne our infirmities. He bore our sorrows. He carried our griefs. He understands. Watch this. Now, when you have a person who has suffered and another person has suffered and this person has a wounded heart and this person has a wounded heart and this person has been broken and this person has been broken, what happens? They connect. <laughs> they connect. And they have a bond that is inseparable because they have like experiences. They've both been hurt. They've both been rejected. They've both been despised. They've both been talked about. They've both been hated. They've both been wooed. It brings a commonality to both of the parties, you and Christ, and therefore they attract like magnets. Therefore, the bond is more intimate and can't be separated. It can't be severed because the bond is so closely knit by the sufferings. That's why he says, who can separate me from the love of God in Christ? Nothing. Because you're like this. Because the bond is so intense, it is so intimate that nothing can separate it. Not death, not life, not affliction, not persecution, not sorrow, not tribulation, not trial. Because now you are in Christ and Christ is in you and there's no separation. This is what suffering does. This is the glory of suffering. Paul wanted to know that and Paul experienced that. He said he shared in the Lord's sufferings. He says because Paul's desire to share in the Lord's suffering because they bring him into a more deeper and more meaningful relationship with Christ. He also says here in another place, I believe it's in 2 Corinthians, he says, therefore I take pleasure in infirmities. How many people are saying that these days? He said, I take pleasure in infirmities, in my weaknesses. He says, in my reproaches, I take pleasure. In my needs, I take pleasure. In persecutions, I take pleasure. In distresses, I play, take pleasure. Why? For Christ's sake. It's all for his glory. He says, for when I'm weak, watch this, he says, then I am strong. That's why he's taking pleasure because Paul knew how to identify his weaknesses and he found opportunities to take his weaknesses, lay them aside, lay them at the feet of Jesus, lay them at the cross. And in exchange for him giving his weaknesses, Paul knew that Christ would give him his strength or his power. He said that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Well, how do you get the power of Christ to rest upon you? Very, very easy. Give him your weakness. Don't give him your strength. You give him your weaknesses. He says here, he says, when I'm weak, then I'm strong. We, when we acknowledge our weaknesses, God will give us his strength. He said his strength is made perfect. It is made complete. It is, uh, it is full in weakness. When I identify a weakness in my life, I take my weakness and lay it at the cross in exchange for his power. Paul prayed, watch this, Paul prayed three times that the Lord would remove this affliction that he had. He said three times I can pray, I pleaded with the Lord that his affliction might leave him. What happened? God denied his requests. And this is something powerful that you got to hear. God denied his request. You say, well, why? What happened? Why would Paul, why would God deny his request? I thought it was God's will. I thought it was God's will to remove the, the, the pain or, 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 or the, the, the weakness or, or, or what he was experiencing. Well, Paul was, had a peculiar uh, relationship with Christ. Unlike you and I, because everybody's course is different. 
No courses are the same. There may be some few similarities here and there. But my cross is not your cross. And your cross is not somebody else's cross. Everybody got their own cross to bear. And this is what needs to be taught and preached in the church, the black church today, about the cross. Nobody's carrying the cross. Nobody wants to bear their own burdens or carry, carry their load. Nobody wants to share it. Nobody wants to do it. Everybody's doing their own thing, but nobody's carrying the cross. Let me get off of that and talk about this. He says, I take pleasure. I take my weaknesses and I lay it down. And he gives me his power. He says, God denied his request and instead gave him his divine strength and promised to demonstrate his power. He said, my grace is sufficient for you. My strength is made perfect in your weaknesses. Now that way alone ought to give you joy. Because even though Paul had this, uh, this weakness, as he describes as a thorn in the flesh, he pleaded with the Lord to take it away from him, and the Lord denied his request. He says, how many times, now listen, how many times have we prayed? How many times have we said, Lord, take this pain away? Lord, take this, this hurt away? Let, take, I'm tired of this suffering and nothing happens. Why didn't the Lord take away Paul's affliction? Was it different from any one of us? Yes, it was. Paul's affliction was likened unto a thorn in the flesh. Paul suffered from egoism, which is pride. Today we would call this thorn a hook. And if you've ever been fishing, which I have, if you ever had a fish hook get stuck in your finger, it's, it's more, it's, it damages more coming out than going in. Because the way the hook is designed, it, and, and the, the, it's hooked, and then it has the sharp end, and it has another sharp end to catch its, its, its victim when it's in the mouth. So if you ever had that hook to go in your skin, it tears more coming out than it does going in. And this is what Paul is describing about, he's talking about this thorn. This thorn that was in his flesh wasn't like the thorns that you and I see. This thorn had a hook-like point in which it went in Paul and if God were to remove it, it would be more damaging to remove it than keep it in. And this is what we had to understand. Paul had a, a apostolic or a, 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 a powerful, powerful authority on his life. And the thorn was given to him because Paul suffered from pride. He had a very egotistic attitude about him, which I'm getting ready to show you. So God said, no, I'm not going to remove this thorn. Because if I remove this thorn from your life, Paul, your life will be more damaged by me removing it than keeping it there. I hope you got that. Listen to what Paul says. He says this in Philippians chapter 3 verses 1 through 7. Paul says, for we are the circumcision. Now the circumcision were the Jews who had a Jewish custom law that they would circumcise the child on the eighth day of the foreskin, which were different from all the other nations. All the other nations were, not, were uncircumcised. So God gave the Jews... A specific law that on the, the on the on the baby on the eighth day that the son was born, that the son would be circumcised. Now watch Paul. Watch Paul. Listen to his pride talking here. He says, "For we," he's talking about we Jews, the Hebrews. He says, "We are the circumcision who worship God in the spirit," implying that we we don't worship. The other gods that are not in the spirit. Because the father, Jesus said, the father looks for worshipers who worship him in spirit and in truth. He says we, he's talking about we, he's talking about his, his people. He's talking about the Jewish nation. 
He says, we worship God in the spirit. In other words, we got the only right, the only true and only awesome God. He says, we rejoice in Christ Jesus. And then he says, we have no confidence in the flesh. Watch this. In other words, we have reached some Jews at this particular time knew that it didn't, they, it works would not get into, into heaven. Salvation did not come by just works of the, of the law. So there's no confidence in the flesh. But then he goes on, he says, though I also might have confidence in the flesh. See his pride? He says, though I also might have any confidence in the flesh, if anyone else thinks he has confidence in the flesh, he says, I more so. <laughs> he says, I more so. He says, in other words, he's saying if anybody has more confidence in the flesh, if anybody who believes in himself more than me, he says, there's nobody out there. He says, I more so. He says, I got more confidence in my flesh than anybody out there. This is pride. This is Paul's ego talking. Now he begins to boast. We would call that bragging today. He says, watch this. Circumcised the eighth day. That's the law. He kept it. He says, of the stock of Israel. In other words, I come from a bloodline. I come from a pedigree of people who are kings and priests by blood. He says, I'm from the stock of Israel. They called Israel back in the days of Christ, the kingdom and heaven of God. See, when we see kingdom of God, we think of something that is either coming or something that is within. We think the king, no, Israel was called the kingdom of God. They knew who they were called. They knew they were the chosen ones. He says, I am from the stock of Israel. In other words, I got royal blood running in my veins. I'm from Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. All down this whole bloodline, Paul is boasting upon, upon himself. He says, I'm from the tribe of Benjamin. Wow. He's even knowing where he come from. He got, see, you don't know what tribe you from. That's lost. We don't know. See, we are lost people. We are the lost sheep of the house of Israel because you don't know what tribe you come from. And even if you were to go back to Africa, you wouldn't even know where to begin to even know what tribe you come from there because you're lost. You lost your identity. Paul knew who he was. He says, I'm from the tribe of Benjamin. Watch this. He said, a Hebrew of Hebrews. This is a black man talking here, people. He says, I'm a Hebrew of Hebrews. Hebrews were very, very dark-skinned, high, melanin, black, goldish people. They had a gold tone to it. They, 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 were, they had rich melanin. He said, I'm the Hebrew of Hebrews. He said, if there's anybody else a Hebrew, I'm more so. He says, concerning the law, watch this, concerning the law, the law of Moses he's talking about, he says, I'm a Pharisee. Now, you understand, if you've ever read the Gospels, those Pharisees were religious people. They did, They crossed their I's. They dot their T's. They kept the law to the most strictest manner. They didn't do anything to the point that when Christ came, they couldn't even recognize him because Christ fulfilled the law and they didn't understand who he was. And therefore, they rejected him. So watch this. He says he's a Pharisee. Paul was a Pharisee. Concerning zeal, he persecuted the church. And this is Apostle Paul. He killed Christians. He dragged them off and made havoc, the Bible says, of the church. Dragging off men and women and committing them into prison. And he thought he was doing the Lord's will. He was overzealous for the things of God. And he begins to brag. How many Pharisees? It was hard to become a Pharisee. He says, concerning the righteousness which is in the law. In other words, the Jews at that particular time uh, believed that they had to fulfill all the law in order to be right standing or righteous with God in order to get into the kingdom of God or to get into the kingdom because they were believing Christ to send forth the kingdom, which would be the millennial kingdom. That's why they said, Lord, at this time, are you going to restore the kingdom to Israel? In other words, Lord, when is the kingdom coming? 
The millennial kingdom, he said, it's not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father has put in his authority. Thank God they didn't get the kingdom because if they got the kingdom, we wouldn't get the kingdom. All right. Watch this. He says the righteousness which is in the law. And here it says, you can read it for yourself. Philippians 3, 1 and 7. He said blameless. He said I'm blameless. He fulfilled this entire law. Paul did. That's why he was egotistic. That's why he was full of pride. That's why that thorn had to stay in his flesh. Because if he pulled, God pulled it out, his pride would have swallowed him up. Because look at his credentials. Look at his history. Look at his background. Look at his stock. Paul, watch this, had impressive credentials. Outstanding religious and human achievements. But no matter how impressive they were, he knew that only personal salvation and eternal life could only come through Christ Jesus. Therefore, he said, all these things I count as a loss for the excellency and the knowledge of Christ. But he's from pride. If you read the scriptures carefully, his most and his pride came up many times in the scripture. He said, I'm the most, I'm the most in, in fear, I'm the, not the most inferior of the most intimate apostles. In other words, he ranked himself among the 12 apostles that Christ sat with. Even though he didn't see Christ in his natural form, he saw Christ in his glorified form on the road of Damascus. And he compared and likened himself that I'm just like Peter, James, and John and all of them. This is pride he was dealing with, saints. <laughs> this man had pride. And God knew it. He said, by the abundance of the revelations that in the mysteries that I received, he said, a thorn in the flesh was given to me. I prayed, Lord, take it out. Lord, remove it. God said, no, it's going to stay in you because if I take this, remove this thorn, your pride would destroy you. Paul had impressive upbringing, nationality, I'm getting ready to close, family background, inheritance, orthodoxy, which is right teaching, activity and morality. Paul belonged to the tribe of Benjamin, a heritage greatly esteemed among the Jews. From this tribe had come Israel's first king, which was Saul. Paul was also a Pharisee. A member of a very devout Jewish sect during Christ's time that scrupulously kept its own numerous rules in addition to the law of Moses. He says, therefore, most gladly, Paul says, I will glory. In other words, I'm not boasting. I'm not taking. I will glory. I will boast in Christ. He's not boasting in, he's not, he's not, he said, I'm not going to have confidence in the flesh. Even, even though I struggle with the confidence in the flesh, Paul was saying, I'm more so than any of y'all. He says, I got more confidence. He says, I'm going to take and I'm going to stop boasting in Christ. He said, I will boast in my infirmities, in my weaknesses, that the Christ, the power of Christ may rest upon me. He says, how do we get, how do we get, how do we get Christ's power to rest upon us? Here's a secret here. He says, by rejoicing, by rejoicing, by, 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 by glorying in our infirmities is equivalent to the word glory. Rejoicing in the Lord, Paul says, always in, always in every test, always rejoicing in every trial, always rejoicing in every affliction, always rejoicing in distress, always rejoicing in suffering, always rejoicing in needs, always rejoicing in persecutions. When we commit to that, Christ's power and strength will rest upon us. It is a constant, never-ending attitude of joy. Knowing that I am sharing in sufferings of the risen Jesus, that I may share and partake of his when revealed in me. Paul encourages the Hebrews hold fast the confidence and rejoicing of hope firm to the end. And here's my points here. Number one, in order for healing to take place for the wounded, we must first lay us. And sin that easily besets us. Number two, we must pick up our cross or get back into the race that 
is set before us and run with diligence the race that is set before us looking unto Jesus. Number three point is we must persevere through all our afflictions, all our obstacles, all our sufferings, knowing that these sufferings are not ours. They are his and we're just partaking of them because there's a glory that needs to be revealed in us. Number five, we must stay humble and not be filled with pride in order for us to keep the Christian race and share with his sufferings. Last point is rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice that his power is made perfect in our weaknesses. And in the weak can say I'm strong and the feeble can say I'm strong. And that the power of Christ may rest upon us. And then we can persevere and endure every affliction that comes our way. That's where healing begins. That's where healing takes place. But it takes that one first initial to step. It's just lay it aside. Like I told you earlier, don't throw it away. It's not trash. God, don't, God has no problem with having memories. He's not concerned about the memory. God wants you to have good memories of those who have left us and gone on. God has a problem of you holding on to the pain. Because the Holy Ghost is looking at you right now saying, just give me the pain. I want the pain. You can keep the memory. That's fine. You can keep the memorabilia. That's fine. God wants that pain. He wants that heart to work on. And that's the problem that most people have. They can't disconnect from the pain. They can't disconnect from the hurt. I just told you the secret. Just lay it aside. Don't worry about throwing it away. Don't worry about putting it behind you. Those words are not included in the Bible. God says lay it aside with gentleness. He knows how sensitive it is. And once you take that path, get back into the race and start running. Diligently looking unto Jesus. The author's up and finish on it. Don't look back. He says, he who has put his hands to the plow and looking back is not fit for the kingdom of God. You got to keep focused on Christ. And keep your eyes on Jesus, author and finisher of my faith. My time is up. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for joining this broadcast again. David Jones works at Ministries. You have a blessed week. Stay safe in all your ways. And remember, Jesus loves you, and so do I. God bless you.